Hey everybody, welcome to Talking Scripture, a podcast where we illustrate relevance and application of the scriptures in Come Follow Me. We also dive into the history and cultures of the text. Thanks for taking the time to share and subscribe to this podcast. For show notes, head over to our website, TalkingScripture.org. Welcome to Talking Scripture. I'm Mike. And I'm Bryce. And today we're going to be in 35, 20 through 26. And this is the Savior's favorite story, isn't Clearly, it? Clearly, Jesus has a favorite story, Mike. And anyone who watches for it will recognize it because he told it to almost every Old Testament prophet. And you can see elements of the story in the Old Testament, especially it appears when they were discouraged. That when they were downtrodden because they looked at their own people and they saw failure and disobedience and breaking covenants, that's the moment that Jesus would tell them the story. He does that exact same thing with Ether in the Book of Mormon, who really was an Old Testament prophet. When Ether gets discouraged as he watched the Jaredites fall apart, he gets a version of the story. Uh, Jesus tried to tell the story to the Jews in the New Testament, but the Father forbade him because they weren't quite prepared to receive it. And so he comes to America, and he has a righteous audience, and so he finally gets to tell the full version of the story. And it's just fun to see him do it. You can almost sense the thrill and excitement on the Savior's part as he tells this story. There is no question he has told it repeatedly to Russell M. Nelson, and it is now Russell Nelson's favorite story, and Russell Nelson tells the story every time he can. And so let me just kind of point out that he started it back in 15 and 16. Let me see if I can point out a few words here, and you see if you can recognize the story. So chapter 15, he introduced the idea that I told the Jews about you by saying, other sheep I have, but that's the only thing the Father would let me say because they weren't prepared. But I say unto you that you were the other sheep I was referring to. So Jesus makes it definitive that in John ten sixteen, other sheep I have, he's referring to the Nephites and the Lamanites in America. And he says to the Nephites and Lamanites, I was telling them about you. And then he tells in chapter 16... Verse 1, now I'm telling you, Nephites and Lamanites, that I have other sheep that I'm going to go visit. And that now brings up the story. That's kind of the setting. Hey, I'm going to go visit the lost ten tribes of Israel. Now notice some key words that he starts to use. In verse 4, he uses a key word, scattered. Scattered forth upon the face of the earth. And then verse 15, and then I will gather them. Verse 7, Behold, because of their unbelief, saith the Father, because of the unbelief of you, O house of Israel, in the latter days shall the truth come unto the Gentiles, that the fullness of these things shall be made known unto them. That, my dear friends, is the Savior's apparent favorite story. He's always talking about the restoration the triumph of the one generation that will not fall into apostasy, the triumph of those in the latter days who will live the gospel. That's why every prophet wanted to see it, because when they would fail, when their own people would fail, wouldn't you want to look to a generation that would succeed? So now he gets interrupted because, you know, they weep because he's going to leave and then he's moved by compassion. So then they have the sacrament and then the calling of the 12. So now chapter 20, he once again appears. This is another visit. And he performs the sacrament again. And then he starts back into the story. Chapter 20, verse 13, which shall be scattered. So that's kind of the beginning of the story is the scattering of the house of Israel but then they will be gathered in from the east and from the west and from the south and from the north. And that's what President Nelson said in conference is his favorite story. It's one that has consumed him, his whole ministry, the gathering of Israel. Verse 14, it involves certain lands. And that's a fascinating story. So verse 15, you see the word scattered. And then in verse 18, gathered. And then verse 20, This people will I establish in this land. And then he starts talking about a city. We're going to build the greatest city that earth has ever known. It shall be a new Jerusalem. 
And so you kind of just see this story being rehearsed. If you get to chapter 21, it gets pretty intense here. Verse 9, For in that day, for my sake, shall the Father work a work which shall be a great and a marvelous work. Tell me how many of those words now ring a bell, right? In that day, for my sake, shall the Father work a work which shall be a great and a marvelous work. And now verse 10, if we were to pinpoint this down to one individual, which we don't have to, but just if we were to pinpoint this down to one single person, 3 Nephi 21 verse 10, but behold, the life of my servant shall be in my hand, wherefore they shall not hurt him, although he shall be marred because of them, yet I will heal him, for I will show unto them that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil." There's a lot of key words in there that he will use specifically in the life of the prophet Joseph Smith. So first he talks about a work that is great and marvelous, and then a servant who will be marred. But I will heal him. And then that phrase, my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil, is almost a word-for-word quotation that he uses in section 10 to describe him thwarting Satan's plan to destroy the Book of Mormon through the loss of the 116 pages. He says that I will show that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. So clearly Jesus is referring to Joseph and the Restoration. But I love to look at verse 10 in terms of every servant of the Lord in the latter days. Every missionary that goes out ought to read 3 Nephi 21 verse 10 to their mom. Because it's true of every one of the Lord's servants that he will hold his servants in his hands in the latter days. I think you can add verse 11 to that. I mean, look what it says there. If you don't believe in my words, who am Jesus, and then skip down where it talks about the words that will give unto him power, that he shall bring them forth to the Gentiles. So now we're talking about the servant. They shall be cut off from among my people who are of the covenant. In essence, my packaging of this today in 2020 is, if I'm going to rail against the president of the church, well, I'm going to cut that thread. And that's Brigham Young, right? That's exactly, Kirtland. Brigham Young and Kirtland. They says, don't cut the thread to the prophet. That's that beautiful. is so important. Yep. Don't cut the thread to the prophet. And then verse 12, my people who are a remnant of Jacob shall be among the Gentiles, yea, in the midst of them as a lion among the beasts of the forest, as a young lion among the flock of the sheep. Now that is a reference to Old Testament, Micah, and all sorts of prophets in the Old Testament. He has been telling this story so long. It's the story of the restoration. And so just notice verse 22, chapter 21, 22, I will establish my church among them. The establishing of the Savior's church among the Gentiles in the latter days is the glorious restoration that he talks so frequently about. And to verse 22, again, it, it, it involves a specific land. And then 23 and 24 this city, he keeps mentioning this city. My people will build a city. In fact, the whole restoration is so that they can build a city which shall be called a new Jerusalem. And then shall they assist my people and they will gather into this land, into the new Jerusalem. So Jesus has been telling the story of the restoration from the very beginning. Now, let me just show you what, what it must have been like to, an, to be an Old Testament prophet. And we're going to use Ether in the Book of Mormon because that book didn't go through the hands of the great and abominable church and lose plain and precious parts. So flip with me to Ether just for a brief moment. Let me just show you this story. So towards the end of Ether, if you go to like 11 and 12... Look at chapter 11. The chapter heading says, Wars, dissensions, and wickedness dominate Jaredite life. And then chapter 12. This is the prophet Ether pleading. And he used, this is his great sermon on, uh, between Ether and Moroni. It's their sermon on faith. And then chapter 13 is just kind of an odd little chapter, right? I wonder if Ether was getting discouraged by the wickedness of his people. And so the Lord told him the story. Notice the chapter heading. 
And then notice verse 6, a new Jerusalem would be built upon this land. And listen to the description of the city. Verse 8, wherefore the remnant of the house of Joseph shall be built upon this land and shall be a land of their inheritance. And they shall build up a holy city unto the Lord like unto the Jerusalem of old, and they shall no more be confounded until the end come when the earth shall pass away. And then verse 10, speaking of this beautiful city, and then cometh the new Jerusalem, and blessed are they who dwell therein. For it is they whose garments are white through the blood of the Lamb. Now why would Ether get that story at that moment? Isn't that seem odd? That why would Ether need to know that? And it sure seems to me that the Lord would cheer up downtrodden prophets who were a little discouraged as they watch their own people reject the truth. He would cheer them up with the story of the restoration. We see the same thing in the New Testament with the dissolution of Christianity John sees the same vision, yeah. and it's almost like it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. Now, if you think about it, the Book of Mormon ends horribly. The Book of Mormon would make a horrible movie, right? Because bad guys win and good guys lose. But the last chapter of the Book of Mormon is what makes the Book of Mormon such a beautiful story, because the last chapter of the Book of Mormon is the restoration. It's what the people will do with the Book of Mormon in our day. We... My dear friends, we are the Savior's favorite story. And that should compel us to rise up from the dust and shake off the dust and be Israel. I hope you heard what Russell Nelson said, that Israel is a people where God has prevailed and that in the latter days, God is going to prevail. One final glorious dispensation where we do not fall into apostasy. And that's what Jesus is trying to do here. Don't get so caught up in chapter 20 and 21. Don't get caught up into the details. A lot of people get caught up in the details and they want to know the order in which things are going to proceed in the second coming. See the glorious story. Now let me share with you a quotation from Jeffrey R. Holland about this marvelous story. He once gave a fireside to the youth pled with them to accept their part of the story, and then said the following. I have a theory about those earlier dispensations and the leaders, families, and people who lived then. I have thought often about them and the destructive circumstances that confronted them. They faced terribly difficult times and for the most part did not succeed in their dispensations. Apostasy and darkness eventually came to every earlier age in human history. Indeed, the whole point of the restoration of the gospel in these latter days is that it was not able to survive in earlier times and therefore had to be pursued in one last triumphant age. We know the challenges Abraham posterity faced and still do. We know of Moses' problems with an Israelite people who left Egypt but couldn't quite get Egypt to leave them. Isaiah was the prophet who saw the loss of the ten Israelite tribes to the north. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel were all prophets of captivity. Peter, James, and John, and Paul, the great figures of the New Testament, all saw apostasy creeping into the world almost before the Savior had departed and certainly while they themselves were still living. Think of the prophets of the Book of Mormon living in a dispensation ending in such painful communication between Mormon and Moroni about the plight they faced and the nation they loved, dissolving into corruption, terror, and chaos. In short, apostasy and destruction of one kind or another was the ultimate fate of every general dispensation we have ever had down through time. But here's my, my theory. My theory is that those great men and women, the leaders of those ages past, were able to keep going, to keep testifying, to keep trying to do their best, not because they knew that they would succeed, but because they knew that you would. I believe they took courage and hope not so much from their own circumstances as from yours. A magnificent congregation of young adults like you tonight gathered by the hundreds of thousands around the world in a determined effort to see the gospel prevail and triumph. 
One way or another, I think virtually all of the prophets and early apostles had their visionary moments of our time, a view that gave them courage in their own less successful areas. Those early brethren knew an amazing amount about us. Prophets such as Moses, Nephi, and the brother of Jared saw the latter days in tremendously detailed vision. Some of what they saw wasn't pleasing, but surely all of those earlier generations took heart from knowing that there would finally be one dispensation that would not fail. Ours, not theirs, was the day that gave them heavenly and joyful anticipation and caused them to sing and prophesy of victory. Ours is the day, collectively speaking, towards which the prophets have been looking from the beginning of time. And those earlier brethren are over there still cheering us on in a very real way. Their chance to consider themselves fully successful depends on our victory and our faithfulness. That's the story. And I think every Latter-day Saint should rise up and be what they saw us to be, the victorious Latter-day Saints who would live the gospel when every other dispensation failed. I remember having those thoughts on my mission where I was like, this is a hard day. And then the thought would occur to me, I've always wanted to go on a mission and I have two years to do it. Do I want to dwell in this is hard or am I just going to get to work? And if you think about how long we're here on earth, we're not here very long, are we? Nope. So we got to maximize what we can. We got to do what we can, don't we? I love the fact that Jesus loved our story. I love the fact that he told the story of the restoration. And so sometimes when I look around and I see discouragement and despair, I just think, wait a minute, we we ought to rise up and be the people that he saw that we would be. We are part of the greatest dispensation. And so it's time to shake off the dust and rise up and be Israel. It it had to have been hard for Mormon to write this story and to see this. I'm sure Mormon had this vision too. And it probably helped him get through the times of depression because, I mean, in Mormon's day, when you say the good guys lost, part of the problem is that the good guys flipped sides. Became so corrupt. When you read what those Nephites were doing in Mormon's day, there is no question. Anyone can see why God wiped them off. And I think even in today's culture where we live in this sea of chaos and everyone's fighting about things, I think that we're not unlike Mormon's day. I really like how you say we got to keep this vision in our mind and know where we're going and know who we're fighting for. And that is the message. I really like 20. The first 10 verses is where Jesus feeds them and gives them the sacrament, right? And in verse 6, it says there's no bread, so Jesus is providing this. And anciently, that's what the king would do every new year. They would have this big festival, and the king would provide the food. And then Jesus is quoting three prophets. He's going to quote Isaiah and Micah and Malachi. And this is kind of a really cool thing to look at structurally, but the 20th and 21st chapter is written in such a way that it's poetic, that it's a chiastic structure, meaning that the front end and the back end are the same, and then B is the same as B prime and so forth, and then you get to what's called the apex of the chiastic structure, which is the center or the central message. And so this starts in the 20th chapter, right after he feeds him, right in verse 10, and then it concludes in the end of 22. And the beginning of this is fascinating to me. Look in verse 10 of chapter 20. It came to pass that when they had all given glory to Jesus, he said to them, behold, now I finish the commandment which the Father has commanded me concerning this people who are a remnant of the house of Israel. And I'm just going to call that the Father and the Son are working together. That's the beginning. And the end of this structure is the same message. So go with me to 3 Nephi 21 verse 28 and look what it says. Yea, and then shall the work commence, the work of the gathering, pretty much everything President Nelson is talking about. The work will commence with the Father among all nations and preparing the way whereby his people may be gathered home to the land of their inheritance. And they shall go out from all nations, and they shall not go out in haste, nor by flight. For I will go before them, saith the Father, and I will be their reward. And so it begins and ends with this message that there's going to be this gathering and the Father and the Son are going to work together. 
Now, we'll provide in the show notes all the details of this. It's beautifully constructed that when Mormon put this together, put these teachings together, he's showing you that the Father and the Son are working together, and it's just fascinating. And he talks about things like America being the land of the inheritance and that New Jerusalem will be the Lord's covenant that he made with Moses and the prophets and that the gospel in Zion will be established. And then there's some interesting things in here about the kings of the world being speechless. This is a quotation right out of Isaiah 52, 15. But the center of this whole message is the sign, the sign of the covenant. So go to the 21st chapter. And these are the three verses I would encourage you to highlight. And they're verses 3 through 5. And it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, when these things shall be made known unto them. So we gotta, we got to ask ourselves, what are these things and who are them? So we'll talk about that. When these things are made known unto them of the Father, and shall come forth of the Father from them unto you. Well, what's that talking about? Well, these things are the words of the Book of Mormon. When the words of the Book of Mormon are going to come forth, and they'll be made known unto them. And them is going to be the Gentiles. Joseph Smith and his associates and the early members of the church, as they took the words of the gospel and the Book of Mormon to the people, that's the sign, the sign that the gathering is taking place, this story. Verse 4, For it is wisdom in the Father that they should be established in this land and be set up as a free people by the power of the Father that these things, the words of the Book of Mormon, might come forth from them unto a remnant of your seed. So the people that Jesus is talking to, their children are going to hear the words of the Book of Mormon, that the covenant of the Father may be fulfilled, which he has covenanted with his people, O house of Israel. Therefore, when these works and the works which shall be wrought among you hereafter shall come forth from the Gentiles unto your seed, which shall dwindle in unbelief because of iniquity. And then he goes on and he just basically says, then you know the sign's happening. That's verse 7. The work's already commenced, and stuff's going to happen. So that's the sign, and we're living in it. And notice that the establishment of America, that the Revolutionary War, that the establishment of the Constitution is part of the story. He throws that in there, that they will be set up as a free people by the power of the Father. So this story is a long, drawn-out story that involved Columbus coming to America and pilgrims coming to America and the United States being established. And, and the Constitution. Are, and the, the Constitution and then Joseph Smith and the Restoration. And then here we are kind of coming into the scene when all of that is now past and uh, future, other things are future. Yeah, I, I do believe this that the Constitution is inspired. It's in our canonized texts. I believe that the Lord is very interested. If you're a listener from the United States of America, I believe that the Lord is very interested in the freedom of the Republic and the keeping of the Union together. And I also think that the adversary is very interested in dissolving the Union and dissolving those principles. And to me, the Civil War was the adversary's attempt to break apart the seedbed of the restoration. If he could rip out the soil, then there's going to be no root. And so our history is kind of complex, but I see the history of our nation as part and parcel with the restoration. I, I can't separate the two. God is part of this. God is involved in this. And so we kind of stand on this privileged position as Americans to take the gospel to the world. I think that that puts us in a distinct position, that we have a responsibility. Uh, look in the 20th chapter, verse 18. It talks about, I will gather my people together as a man gathereth his sheaves unto the floor. So I want to talk about that just for a second, and then we'll get to Micah. So the early threshing floor was a piece of property that David purchased. Now, it's it's a pun. If you go to 2 Samuel 24, 16 and 17, but you gonna got to read the rest of 2 Samuel 24, we read in there that David purchases the threshing floor from a guy whose name is super close to the word for the Ark of the Covenant. It's like so close. And so what that threshing floor becomes is the center of the Holy of Holies, this threshing floor. There's this narrative in the book of Ruth, chapter 3, where Ruth proposes marriage to Boaz, and it says that she proposed to him on the threshing floor where they separated the, the chaff from the wheat, that piece of property that David purchased, that the Holy of Holies becomes, becomes a symbol for the temple itself. It becomes this symbol for life. 
that sacred space represents the family, represents what life is. And so when Jesus says, I will gather my people as a man gathereth his sheaves, it's multi-layered. Yes, he's going to gather us. Yes, we gather wheat. But it's rich in temple symbolism. And what God is trying to say is, this is more than just gathering wheat. He says, I'm going to make you mine, and you're going to have the seeds of life in you. And so that's a really important thing. Now, from a cultural perspective, the Greeks, when they got together and they would watch these dramas played out, and this is the beginning of theater, the beginning of all of our movies and our theater and our drama come out of this tradition, we would sit around in a circle anciently around the threshing floor, and that's where the drama would be played out. And the drama would be the forces of light against the forces of darkness, and hopefully if it was a good story, the forces of light would win out, and it was all being played out on the threshing floor. And if you think about the temple, this is Hugh Nibley, where he says drama and and these stories, they come out of the temple. And then we have these symbols of kingship. So now we're into the Micah passages. So if you go to 3 Nephi 20, verse 16, he says, Then shall ye, who are the remnant of the house of Jacob, go forth among them, and ye shall be in the midst of them who shall be many, and ye shall be among them as a lion amongst the beasts of the forest, and as a young lion amongst the flocks of sheep. Who, if he goeth through, both treadeth down and teareth in pieces, and none can deliver. He quotes Micah 5 twice. Look at verse 12 of chapter 21. And he says kind of the same thing. And then he goes into quoting more of Micah. If you go to verse 14 to verse 19, he talks about, Woe be unto the Gentiles, verse 14, except they repent. And then he says, I'll cut off thy horses out of the midst of thee, and I'll destroy thy chariots. That's quoting Micah 5.10. And then he says, I'm going to cut off their cities and their witchcrafts and their graven images and so forth. And so we read this and we're like, what is this even talking about? This is a really good commentary on these verses. And this is by Joseph Fielding McConkie and Robert Millett. And he says, it is interesting that in 3 Nephi 21, the master quotes a prophecy from Micah 5, 8 through 14, an oracle which uses language similar to, to what we just read. According to the account, the rending of the Gentiles, this metaphor of a lion among sheep takes place in a day when such things as witchcraft, soothsayers, idolatry, immorality, priestcrafts, etc. are all destroyed. When will those things happen? Clearly after the Lord comes and the millennial day has begun. It would seem that the image of the remnant of Israel rending its Gentile enemies is symbolic of Israel's ultimate victory over its foes. A victory which comes when the Savior returns and the wicked are destroyed. I don't see this as some say is like a a massive rebellion or a rebellion destroying the Gentiles. I read this text as a millennial text. What I mean by that is that one day the gathering will take place in such a way that the wicked will be destroyed and the righteous will reign. Now, that's a really tough thing. In 2020, when, when somebody says the wicked will be destroyed, it kind of sounds kind of mean. And if you think about the miracle of the Book of Mormon, I mean, the Book of Mormon doesn't have a lot of miracles in it. You don't see a lot of blind people healed. You don't see anyone walking on the water or parting the sea. But the Book of Mormon is filled with one miracle repeated many times, and it's the miracle of preservation against all odds. Nephi and his brethren, Abinadi against the priests of Noah, Samuel the Lamanite against the arrows that were being shot against him, the stripling warriors, outnumbered, outmanned, and yet preservation against all odds is the miracle of the Book of Mormon, and I really think that is a foreshadowing of what Micah 5 really does mean, preservation against all odds. The the Latter-day Saints, in the latter days, will be a vulnerable little seed that the earth could crush. But God won't allow it to happen. He won't let the earth crush the seed. The seed is going to grow into a mighty tree that can then take care of itself. And it's fun to just sit back and be part of that and recognize that at so many stages could the world have just snuffed out the restoration when we were vulnerable. And we still are, relatively speaking. But God is with his people. He will not let them fail. He is going to help them succeed. So that Micah prophecy is always about, we're going to be a lamb in the midst of the lions. But that will change. It will flip. And then eventually, it will flip, and Israel will be the lion. 
and the wicked will be the lamb. And I just I, I love as we sit back and look at the Book of Mormon's teachings of Micah, it just portrays this image of victory because God prospers us when we were vulnerable and could have been destroyed. He he, he delivered us. The very last verse of the first chapter of the Book of Mormon is that God's tender mercies will be upon the faithful to deliver them. There was a great speaker who said, we are getting more polarized. We have to make a decision. Not making a decision is, is a, a decision. decision. Yeah. Yep. And this is an interesting distinction between the Book of Mormon and the Bible, Bryce. But in the Bible, we have God commanding Joshua and the followers to eliminate the enemy. But in the Book of Mormon, over and over again, the image is, is the wicked will destroy the wicked. And so I'm packaging Micah 5 in this context, and the way I'm going to look at it is God will let it happen. He will let the wicked devour each other, and the only source of truth or light as we become more polarized is going to be teachings of Jesus. Whether or not you're a Latter-day Saint, if you align yourself with those teachings, that's the only hope we have as a people. I'm reading a book right now about the founding of our country, and over and over again, the founding fathers said, we cannot make enough laws to make people be moral. There were two things, two pillars, they said, that would make our country survive, and it was the family and the church. And if we had strong families, and if we were religious, then we could be held together as a republic. And so what does Satan do? That's right. Let's yeah. destroy the family let's and destroy let's the family. destroy the churches. If we can attack those two and we can eliminate them, then we can have chaos. And so kind of my take, this is my Mike Day packaging of Micah 5 too. I could be dead wrong. But the way I see it is, of course, the wicked will be destroyed. I see it as God letting them completely wreck each other, however that works. I know that there's the, the scriptures in here about the elements melting with fervent heat, but I just, I like that reading as well. Now, there's a couple interesting things in here, Bryce, that I find fascinating. There's these two prophets mentioned. There's the one where they quote Deuteronomy, and then there's the one that you've mentioned about Joseph. Go to the one about the Deuteronomy passage. Go to uh, 30 Nephi 20, right after the New Jerusalem passage in verse 22. Look what it says in 23. Behold, I am he of whom Moses spake. Behold, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brother and like unto me. Him shall you hear in all things and whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul who will not hear that prophet shall be cut off from among the people. So Jesus lays it out. He's quoting Deuteronomy 18, verse 15 through 19, where Moses says, there's going to be a prophet like me who's going to come up. And if you don't listen to him, you'll be cut off. And Jesus just says, guys, that's me. I'm that guy. And then in the next chapter, we read a, a great work. This is in 21, verse 9, a marvelous work and a wonder. And then it says, a man shall declare it unto them. And like Bryce said, that's Joseph Smith. The life of my servant shall be in my hand. And that's a really cool image, right? That Joseph is in his hand. And then he says, if they don't listen, if you read the end of verse 11, they shall be cut off from among my people who are of the covenant. Both times, two prophets and then turn the page. Or if you have a phone, just scroll. Go to the end of 22. The 22nd chapter is Jesus quoting Isaiah, and it's a beautiful description of what Zion is. But then go to the end. Look at verse 15. This is Isaiah 54, but it's also 3 Nephi 22. Behold, they shall surely gather together against thee, not by me. Whosoever shall gather together against thee shall fall for thy sake. Behold, I have created the smith that bloweth the coals in the fire, that bringeth forth an instrument for his work, and I have created the waster to destroy. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall revile against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Now i got to tell you, in the context of this, this can be really difficult. So I want to give a couple different readings of that last passage. If we throw this in the context of the two prophets we've just mentioned, both of them get killed. The Savior is crucified. Joseph is killed. And yet we have this promise that no weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And then we got to look at this and say, okay, Isaiah 54 is really to a bigger audience than us. Isaiah 54 is going to the whole world. And so I want to throw a couple perspectives. One of the perspectives is to the Jews. As a Jewish reader of Isaiah 54, this is a tough text. I mean, if you think about this, if you come from a heritage of being a Jew, you probably are related to a lot of people in your family tree 
who got annihilated by the Holocaust. And so from their perspective, and I've read some good commentaries on this, they say, yes, it's true that the enemies of the Jews tried to wipe them out, but it didn't work. This great empire called the Third Reich had a window of about 10 or 15 years, and they were snuffed out, and Judaism continues. And as I read those commentaries, I thought, that's a really good take. If you read it from Mormon's perspective, Mormon's like, oh, what happened to our culture? And yet they bury these records in the ground, and you can see Mormon's hope. And it's like Bryce said, the greatest story ever told, that Mormon's words are going to go out and people are going to feel the spirit and they're going to follow the same principles that Mormon held. And you can almost see Mormon weeping saying, hallelujah. And so I want to just introduce a spiritual idea to read this, that prosper meaning in this context, yeah, the saints are going to go through tough times. Some of them are going to die, but the message is going to continue and the work will go forward. And going back in time to the context of this, this is Isaiah 54, and a lot of Isaiah's words were used in the first, this minority religion in Israel that was wiped out through the editors. The first early Israelite religion believed that Yahweh or Jehovah would come down and be a king, and he would die, and he would get resurrected, and he would redeem his people. Now, that's the, that's the religion of the Book of Mormon. That's the religion that gets edited out of the Old Testament. Well, one of the things that would happen was every year, the king at the new year would be enthroned and he'd be washed and anointed and he and his wife would be clothed and they would get what was called the promise of invulnerability. And that essentially these verses would be read to them, that they would be invulnerable. And we'll put this in the show notes because it doesn't make for the best podcast, but there are so many Psalms where the king has promised this. And this is so important because I'm getting to it. Hold on. We're really talking about you. But I just want to read one psalm. Go to the 91st psalm. And like I said, there are so many of these. But look at this. Verse 1. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I will trust. Surely he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. And he will cover thee with his feathers. Think about the hen gathering the chicks. Think about the covering of the ark has wings on it. You're in the sacred place. You're in the Holy of Holies. Under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh unto thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold, and see the reward of the wicked. And then it goes on. Go to verse 10. There shall no evil befall thee. Verse 11. He shall give his angels charge over thee. Verse 13, and now we're back to Micah. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, and adder's a snake. The young lion and the dragon shalt thou trample under thy feet. This is a promise of invulnerability. This is a promise of kingship. This is the promise that was given to Jesus and Joseph. And both of them died. But the promise is sure. Now think about you. There are sacred spaces that we go to where this promise is given to us that our seed will not be lost and that we will prosper. And if you think about those sacred spaces and you think about what Psalm 91 is talking about, and frankly, there's just a lot of things we can't say over and over again. Mormons like there's just stuff I can't write. This is a promise that is given. This is the heritage of the followers of Jesus. And it says this in here over and over again. This is the heritage of those that follow the Lord. This is about family but it's invulnerability. And to me, my testimony is the only reason it's true is because of the resurrection. Clearly weapons prosper. Clearly Joseph died. The savior died. Followers of many Christians died in the early periods of Christianity. But I read those verses and say, that's a pretty cool promise. And like I said, it's all over in the Psalms and it's right there. And and I'm sure some of the people that are hearing it or their children, they die. But the promise is still true. As symbolized by the Book of Mormon, because the Book of Mormon ends with utter destruction, and yet 
the Book of Mormon is a glorious story yeah. because the message survives, and we in the latter days take that message and succeed. And so I just think that's the glorious hope of the restoration. And you've got to read these chapters. This is a tough block. Um, 3 Nephi 20 through 26 is a tough block of scriptures. But as you read through them, hear the underlying message, and that is the glorious triumph of God through the restoration, that billions of families are going to be sealed. Billions of families are going to be taught, whether it's in this life or through the work of the restoration, it's in the next life. God will succeed in this dispensation, and Jesus will come, and we will triumph. And you, you and I are a part of that. I'm going to make up my jewels, he says. Yeah, yeah. We are a part of that. So the Savior quotes Isaiah in chapter 22, which is all about the victory of Israel. It's Isaiah chapter 54. It's the victory of Israel. Then in chapter 23, he commends us to read the words of Isaiah. And he kind of gives a hint on how to read Isaiah, too. He does. He? he does. He says, all things that Isaiah spoke have been and shall be, which means Isaiah is teaching by patterns. And so find the pattern. If you want to know what shall be, look at what has been. If you want to understand Isaiah as in what has been, look at what shall be. And so a great commentary on Isaiah. And then Jesus asks Nephi to bring forth the records. And he says, now, wait a minute. Didn't I command Samuel the Lamanite to prophesy something, and didn't it happen? And how come you didn't write it? Whoops. How come you didn't write about it? So this is a big deal. Jesus is drawing attention to something that he felt was very important, and yet they didn't think it important enough to write it into their records. And so he's saying, you missed something very important to me. Now, that raises a red flag to me to say, okay, what is important to Jesus that sometimes I don't notice? And the whole thing is, I prophesied that during the darkness, that during the heaviness, after the destruction, when children are crying and people are in despair, many saints would rise from the dead and would appear and minister unto them. Wasn't it so? How come you didn't write it? You've got to write it. Now, why would that moment be so important that Jesus would correct them? And yes, I think he's teaching the doctrine of the resurrection. I think he's teaching that Jesus unlocked death, that his atonement unlocked death. And there's a lot to that. But he's just telling this story about the Latter-day Saints treading through the lions. And I think the point he's trying to make is, wasn't I with you in the darkness? Didn't I comfort you in the, in the darkest moment of your life, in the scariest time in the whole history of the Book of Mormon? If this were the darkest moment, didn't I do something miraculous? And wasn't I with you? Didn't I bring forth the dead? Now you think about of all the things that would have comforted them in the darkness to all of a sudden have grandma there or a lost spouse or a lost child. Now as he's prophesying for the latter days, as he's talking about the story, there will be some scary moments as this story unfolds, as the lions tear each other apart. There will be some scary moments. But I think part of what we need to read is Jesus is stopping the story to emphasize, I will be with you every step of the way. And when it gets dark, look for my help. Look for my comfort and my guidance and look for me. And we got to remember it, don't we? And you've got to remember it. So whether it's, hey, I did something miraculous like raise the dead, or to every Latter-day Saint out there who gets discouraged, he says, wait, didn't I do marvelous things in your past? 
How come you're not remembering those marvelous things? How come you're not anticipating that I will do marvelous things again? And so seen kind of symbolically, this, the last part of chapter 23 is a beautiful message from the Savior to say, you forgot how significant that was. I need to remind you. I will be with you in the darkness. No matter what comes, no matter where this church is heading, no matter what our future lies, we can all trust that Jesus will be with us the whole way, as he has been with us all throughout the past. A practical application of what you're talking about reminds me of when I'm sad. We all have moments, right, where we're just having a rough time. Sometimes just talking about this stuff or just reading it, the light comes in. Yeah. There was a woman one time who came to President Ballard, and she said, my daughter is vexed with the evil spirit. Will you exercise the demons? And he handed her a copy of the Book of Mormon, and he said, tell her to read this. And it was just so simple, right? And the mom was like, why would you tell me that? And he says, because you can't read this book and have darkness. The light will chase it out. And so I think that, to me, is a practical application. You know, the Savior said, if your eye be single, it shall be full of light. I have friends right now that are making, some of them making really bad decisions. And I just think, oh, you, we've got to get light in our eye. And how do we do that, right? We got to remember these things, don't we? And again, I, I mentioned this earlier, but I'm going to go back to that very first chapter of the Book of Mormon, last verse. I, Nephi, will show unto all of you that the tender mercies of the Lord are upon all of us that believe in him and have faith in him and want to do what's right to the deliverance, the tender mercies of the Lord will be with us in the future. That, I think, is part of the glorious story. It's not just what God is doing in the world. It's what God is doing in your life. What's he doing for me? What is he doing for you? That's what makes this such a great glorious story, is that God will prosper in your life. I also believe, Bryce, all those promises about the prophets, about Joseph and about Jesus, on a very small level, you know, that image of where he says that prophet I hold in my hand, I believe every time that I'm trying to serve the Lord, it's the Lord saying that about me. Mike, I have you in my hand. Yeah, and it, it's funny that we reference the loss of the 116 pages, because Jesus specifically says, I will show that my wisdom is greater than the cunning of the devil. And yet the loss of the 116 pages is a marvelous symbol for all of us. Heavenly Father knew 2,400 years in advance that Martin Harris would lose the 116 pages and put a backup copy in the Book of Mormon. He told Nephi to make two sets of plates. Clearly back in 600 BC, he told Mormon, throw that small set in, we're going to need it, even though it's a duplicate. So if the Lord knew 2,400 years in advance that we would need a backup copy of the first part of the Book of Mormon, then clearly he has been putting all the pieces in place in your life to help you succeed. It's the same message. I will not let Satan defeat you. It doesn't mean Joseph, that was, an, that was a very painful experience for Joseph. One of the worst he'd ever had. And yet I'm prepared. There's a plan here. And every single person needs to know that I am in the Lord's hands and that just like he prepared a way for Joseph to escape, he has prepared a way for me to escape. The tender mercies of God are upon all of us. That's the story of the restoration. We can't forget it. I think there's another message, too, that's so important. It's that no matter how far you've come off the path, the Lord's ability and his power is greater than whatever it is you may have done. Yeah. The, Joseph assumed he'd ruined the restoration. Yeah, all is lost, yeah, he says. all is lost. One of Satan's lies is, you know what, Bryce, you've gone too far. Yeah. You're irredeemable. You can't come back. You can't fix what you've broke. That's a lie. And Joseph didn't. He honestly thought, there's no way. I can, I've lost the translation. I've ruined this. And the Lord just smiled and said, no, you haven't. Yeah. And that symbolically applies to all of us, not just to Joseph. Yeah. So, so we got to do Malachi. So then in the next two chapters, <laughs> he quotes this. two chapters of Malachi. Now, this is kind of odd. You would say, why does Jesus quote Malachi? What's the thread that weaves this together, Mike? And they don't have Malachi. They so don't. Malachi is after Lehi they Lehi left. left long before Malachi was a prophet. And so clearly you could say, well, this is good scripture that Jesus wanted to have in the Book of Mormon. But remember, the Book of Mormon was written for us. 
So why would Mormon include Malachi for us knowing that we would have Malachi? And so there's a thread that weaves throughout here, Mike, right? What's the thread? Why Malachi? Notice the very first verse. Go to uh, 3 Nephi 24. In the first verse, it says, It came to pass that he commanded them that they should write the words which the Father gave to Malachi, which he should tell them. So Jesus is like, okay, I'm going to give you this stuff. You guys don't have this material. And it came to pass that after they were written, he expounded them. And it kind of says it a few times where he expounds what Malachi is talking about. So go to the 25th chapter, and the 25th chapter is more of Malachi. It's Malachi 4, but then notice verse 1 of chapter 26, and it says, It came to pass when Jesus had told these things, he expounded them unto the multitude, and he did expound all the things unto them, both great and small. And then in verse 3, he expounded these things unto them. And notice verse 6, where Mormon says, I can't even tell you a hundredth part. But here's my take. I think the whole point of this is he's talking about family. He's talking about, okay, what's Malachi doing? Well, look in the fourth chapter of Malachi, or look in 3 Nephi 25. Behold, the day cometh, verse 1, that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud and all they that do wickedly shall be as stubble, and the day cometh that shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it leave them neither root nor branch. We're back to this tree imagery. And the son of righteousness will arise with healing of it in his wings, and he's going to, verse 6, turn the heart of the fathers to the children. This is going to be explained to Joseph Smith by an angel, and Joseph is 17 years old when he gets this. So just think about this for a minute. At the very beginning of the Restoration, one of the very first revelations that we have canonized chronologically is to a 17-year-old boy. I'm going to read the whole section, all of section 2. This is Moroni to Joseph. He says, Behold, I will reveal unto you the priesthood by the hand of Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall plant in the hearts of the children the promises made to the fathers, and the hearts of the children shall turn to their fathers, and if it were not so, the whole earth would be utterly wasted at his coming. That, to me... Is about family. So Malachi prophesies. Jesus quotes that prophecy in the Book of Mormon. Joseph Smith is quoted that prophecy in section two. We find that prophecy again quoted in section 128. It's all over the scriptures. Is it safe to say, as we culminate this great story, as you study the Savior's favorite story about the story of the restoration, it's almost as if he says, that the whole point of the restoration, and I'm going to go out on a limb here, the whole point of the founding of America so that we could restore the gospel, the whole point of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, of the priesthood coming, the whole point of missionary work is so that families can be sealed for time and all eternity. That's it, the family. Otherwise says Moroni to Joseph Smith, the whole earth would not have lived up to its purpose. The and, whole earth would have been a waste. And if I'm the adversary, what's my whole objective? The family. I've got to destroy it. That's right. And I've got to rip the republic apart. I've got to rip the principles of freedom apart. And I've got to attack it and never stop. And redefine what marriage is. And I've got to attack the family. And so I just think this is so significant that we end with Malachi and Malachi's prophecy of the coming of Elijah and the keys that Elijah would bring and the work that Elijah would bring. So lest we get caught up in the fact that the restoration is a cause in and of itself, the restoration is the means to do what we really need to do. The greatest story of them all is that Heavenly Father's purposes are to bind families for eternity. That everything else, the, the, so many people call the church the, the scaffolding, that it is building the eternal building. And the only thing that really matters is the building of the family. Sometimes the critics of Joseph Smith say that the concept of eternal marriage was a Nauvoo invention, that you know he's in his late 30s and he just kind of comes up with this plan. But I can't read section two, and it's right there in those three verses. It's plain as a nose on my face. Yep. The whole point, 
the whole point of the restoration. I just love that we culminate this week's reading with Malachi of Jesus telling about the restoration, the new Jerusalem, Joseph Smith, the missionary work, is so that we understand the significance of the new and everlasting covenant of marriage. That that is the whole point of the gospel, finding a companion. Bruce R. McConkie said the two most important things that any Latter-day Saint ever does in this world are marry the right person in the right place by the right authority, and then number two, keep that covenant. This is the culmination of the restoration of the gospel. It is the sealing of the family. And so we end right there. Now, go back to chapter 26. Let me just throw something out, a challenge out there that the Savior gives us. So clearly, the Nephites were taught things that Mormon doesn't include in the portion of the gold place that Joseph Smith was going to translate. I can only give you like 1%. It's nothing. But there is so much more. There's a whole sealed portion of the gold plates, and there's so much more. And so Mormon says in verse 8, I'm back in chapter 26, these things I have written, which are the lesser part of the things which he taught the people. So what we have in Third Nephi, what we have in the translated portion of the Book of Mormon is the lesser part and I have written them to the intent that they may be brought again to this people. Now listen to verse 9. And when they shall receive this, which is expedient that they should have first to try their faith. And if it so be that they shall believe these things, then shall the greater things be made manifest unto them. But if you won't believe the portion of the Book of Mormon that we have, you'll never get the greater things. Verse 11, Mormon was about to write them on the plates that we that would be translated. Mormon was a, about to write some of the truths that Jesus taught that are for that are part of part two. I was about to write them all which were engraven upon the plates of Nephi, but the Lord forbade it, saying, I will try the faith of my people. We need to understand that the Book of Mormon that we have been given is a test. It is a key that unlocks a door that just flows with more information. Now, this is both literal and figurative. Passing the test of the Book of Mormon will unlock added scripture. We still have a whole sealed portion of the Book of Mormon to get. We still have the whole record of the Lost Ten Tribes. Jesus went to visit the Lost Ten Tribes, and they wrote about it. We have a lot of scripture coming, but we won't get that scripture until we pass the test of the Book of Mormon. It has been given to us as a test. Then the second part, I believe that so many prophets have taught that that is a symbolic, that individually, if you are faithful to the scriptures that you have, it doesn't matter if the rest of the church isn't ready to receive them. You can receive revelation for you that what unlocks revelation is passing the test of the revelation that we receive. Now, let me just give you an example of the early day saints, and I, I worry that we're still under this condemnation. If you'll turn to Doctrine and Covenants section 84, the Lord mentions that the early saints, starting in verse 54, had treated something lightly. Their minds had been darkened because they had treated something lightly. And that treating it lightly brought the whole church under condemnation. And this condemnation resteth upon Zion, even upon all. And they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant even. Here's what they treated lightly. The Book of Mormon and the former commandments. I think he's including the Bible in that as well. We had forgotten, we have treated lightly the Book of Mormon and the former commandments. Have you ever had this happen, Bryce, where you read something and it was like you've read it a hundred times and then you read it and your mind just opens and you're like, how did I miss that? How did I miss that? Have you ever been frustrated that your past self didn't catch what you're catching now? Yeah. To me, that's also getting new scripture, meaning I can read the same the words same on the verses. page, but I'm getting new scripture. Yep. And notice how he finishes verse 57. Passing the test of the Book of Mormon is done in two ways, that we need to repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon, and the former commandments which I have given them, not only to say, but to do. 
I think passing the test of the Book of Mormon is done by what we say. We need to use it more. We need to use it in our sermons. We need to use it in our sacrament talks. We need to use it in family home evening. We need to use it often. We need to use the teachings of the Book of Mormon. We need to say them more often. We need to testify of the Book of Mormon more frequently. But more than that, we need to live the Book of Mormon. We will unlock new scripture when we live the teachings of the Book of Mormon that we have. If you want more scripture, live the truths of the Book of Mormon. Live what we're being taught. Use it more often. Use it more in your families. Use it more in family home evening. Use the Book of Mormon to solve your personal problems. Find answers in the Book of Mormon. And when we do that, we unlock other revelation. But we have to do it by what we say and by what we do. And so the Book of Mormon is a test. It's a test. Neil A. Maxwell said the following regarding that test and this pains me to read this, but I wonder how, if we, if we as a church are still not passing the test, if we're still treating lightly the Book of Mormon, both to say and to do. Neil A. Maxwell said, thus the Book of Mormon is like a vast mansion with gardens, towers, courtyards, and wings. There are rooms yet to be entered with flaming fireplaces waiting to warm us. Yet we as church members sometimes behave like hurried tourists, scarcely venturing beyond the entry hall. We've got to get to the upper rooms of the Book of Mormon. We've got to get to the closets and the basements and the backyard. The Book of Mormon should be a lifetime pursuit, something that we never put down. Of that book... I testify with everything I live for, everything that I am. But I also testify that the whole point of that book is to make eternal families, make the family last for eternity. And with that, we thank you for listening and we'll see you next week. Talking Scripture is not an official production of The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The opinions expressed in this podcast are Mike and Bryce's opinions only. We refer you to official church sources and the church website to clarify any doctrinal questions. <laughs>